It is February the 17th, 2024. I'm Chris, and this is the future of the future of photography. Another week, another episode. I'm Chris. There's Adrian and Jeremiah. Hello. And hey. Hey. <laughs> More enthusiasm, <laughs> please, gentlemen. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm very oh. excited to be here. Yeah, me yeah. too. T C that's what I'm talking about. I'm kicking off my weekend with the recording. I, but honestly, thank you both for like uh, like sacrificing part of your Saturday to do these recordings because that is usually the like that's the time you want to spend with your family. You know what? It's easy. It's easy because I'm I'm I only wake up around ten. And we do you know. So I'm sleepwalking <laughs> as usual. So ah, that explains I, I, a lot. <laughs> I'm beginning. I don't really. <laughs> I don't really start my a, weekend till until <laughs> after yeah. this is done. And it's not a sacrifice to do this show. I know it's fun with you guys. It's fun. That's all right. That's all right. I I, I, yeah, I, I wonder how it'd be if if we ever actually met in person. Oh, <laughs> mayhem. Like, mayhem for sure. Weird. So I, I just wanted to express how happy I am that we're doing this this little <laughs> show here. It's just, fun. I think it's fun. It's cool. Yeah. Um, we have a fun topic today. If if you if, if you're not living under a rock, you have most likely heard of it. Um, we want to talk about Sora. Sora S O R A is uh, OpenAI's latest release. It's a text to video system. So you put in you input some text, explain what you want that thing to make, and it makes a scene up to up, up, up to I think a minute. Good quality. Uh, as it seems, high fidelity, good good temporal consistency, as in people won't just be a different person in the next frame. Um, <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's at a quality level that we haven't seen before. Uh, if you're watching the video, I'm going to bring some of these things on the screen so uh, they have a, a bunch of examples on there um the, the one that i've that everyone's probably seen is this lady in a red dress walking uh on a tokyo street with water with reflections and um there's plenty more um these are these are i thought these were, these were highly cherry picked these I'm, examples I'm I'm sure they are, and you know it's not open yet. Uh, they just... are to an extent, but then what? What Sam Altman did uh, on on Twitter or X is that he asked people, "Send me prompts, and I'll render stuff," and uh, returned with decent outputs from these prompts. So there's it's it's fairly convincing at least in s some of the output is, is very convincing we're looking at this scene at this drone shot of a uh, uh, big sir with the uh, with the water um, and uh, and the land and this 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 can easily pass as a just a general sure. stock what, video, what, right what's interesting to me is you know having used Pika and um, runway which are the competition uh, products. Yeah. Um, they are, you know, at least a generation or more behind yes. in terms of quality. What's also very interesting is that um, OpenAI's video rendering quality has leapfrogged them significantly, and yet their image-making um, <laughs> applications lags significantly that, behind the competition. That is one thing I definitely wanted to touch on. We have uh, Dali 3 by OpenAI. Yeah. And Dali 3, compared to Midjourney, for example, is way behind. Yeah. It's, it's pretty much, I mean, it feels kind of trashy in, in many ways. Uh, but this leaps forward and and my question to to all of us or listeners is what is the difference in terms of the prompt processing and rendering that makes the video which obviously needs a lot more compute power so much better and yet they cannot get the same or better quality on the image rendering. I'm very, very sure that 
we're talking about two very independent models here, like uh, neural networks. And uh, DALI 3 was trained, I don't know, a year ago or something. And this one is just, uh, it's just newer and maybe even a different team has worked on that. So no I, I would expect to see their, their photo generation tool the DALI 4 to be based on Sora or be the same model as a code base. Because the difference between a still and a, and a moving picture um, shouldn't be that big of a difference, right? No. And, and it, it's significant when you look at the imagery. Um, I mean, so far, I mean, you know, we all have our preferences, but Mid Journey seems to get better and better and better. And yet, you know, runway just seems to be locked in a, I don't know, it doesn't seem to be leapfrogging. And, you know, I say this with all due respect because the speed of innovation on oh. all of these things is so incredibly do guys, fast. Do you guys remember uh, Will Smith eating spaghetti? Have you have you seen that? It's, it's a video that came out. I think so. Um, let me see. Um, I will put this on the screen. So it's it's about a year old. Um, eating spaghetti. And here we go. Um, so it's about a year old. And it was an earlier attempt of rendering a video from a text prompt. And that's a year ago. And it's horrible. It is. It'll give you <laughs> nightmares. And this has this has made rounds about a year ago. So, th the difference what we see there to what we see now is staggering. It is mm. just wild. What what's happening uh, in yeah, this, this field? Particular One year is is an it's an amazing exponential. Yeah, uh, speed bump here. I mean, the 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 scene that we're looking at, we're chasing a what looks like a old Land Rover through a um, cliffside road, dusty. Um, but if you look at this, they in mid prompt they can change the color, they can change the car, they can change yep. the environment, they could even make it underwater or neon or surreal or jungly, just as it continues. Um, to express the distance between the so-called camera and the object. Um, this is going to be radically amazing. In, uh, like I predict in, you know, three years, four years, this kind of opportunity for filming filmmakers is going to radically change our, our aesthetic. It, just, just one year between uh, Will Smith eating spaghetti and this, uh, just extrapolate that by one more year. Um, so, mm. so I've I've heard mainly professionals express their well astonishment, um, fear. <laughs> Where is this going to take us? I mean, this this is it's it's again. I I don't think it's exactly there yet. But give it another year or maybe two, and you will have this. Could would you? Jeremiah, use this as, uh, let's say, to create some background plates, to create a street oh. full of people in the background of uh, one of your productions, would you? No, absolutely. For example, <clears throat> today, um, if I was doing a, a, a scene in a show, a TV show, probably not a film, but I, it would be worth exploring the mm -hmm. um, how how being you can kind of render. We, but we, but, we it, don't know exactly the tech right. specs of this just yet. Yeah. But in terms of a television series, uh, if I'm shooting a shot of two people in a car, they're in the front seat, they're driving, the camera angles are kind of three-quarter uh, to them, out the background will be moving, moving landscape, urbanscape. The, 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 what, what used to be background projection and now is... Yeah. Pretty much green screen. You can get a basically a large television screen, not <laughs> yes. not even a, a kind of LED screen, a television screen. Throw up a plate which you can you can kind of write you on the generate, fly, right? Right there, and you can go like, oh, should we make it a little more moody? Should we make it evening? Should we make it day? Sun dappled, all of that. 
and um, attach it to a few screens, maybe one as a key light, so that the you know the the actual rendering of the dynamic range uh, fluttering will, will light the principal, so you'll have some interactive light and the background uh, moving. You could do that today, and that'll save you sending out a crew to shoot background plates. I mean, uh, this, uh, this this is the 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 the, the areas of dis of potential disruption of likely disruption. We're talking uh, simple things in the process like storyboarding, concept uh, art. That kind of stuff is gone, right? No, gone. no people doing that anymore. Um, location scouting because you will not need locations anymore at least to a certain extent b-roll um background plates um virtual sets digital backdrops yeah. stock stock of course um what advertising, else? advertising. Uh, training videos um there's a lot of areas <coughs> that are going to struggle and i believe with with store sora having been presented now um it's finally where the where the penny drops with a lot of people. I think we're at, this is the pivot point for video. Um, once you get into lip syncing, avatars, realism, I, th I would describe this as the democratization of cinema in many ways. So people with an understanding of the tools as they get more sophisticated um, and how we can integrate realistic actors or actors themselves into this. I think, um, now I've said this before that, you know, with all of the access that YouTube provides and the desktop tools and inexpensive cameras and lighting, we have not yet seen a Citizen Kane emerge um, in YouTube by kids in the basement. We've seen cute little things here and there, great, wonderful, but we haven't seen a powerful projection um, of a story yet, at least I haven't. I think when we start to democratize high quality video, then the storytelling availability to anyone with a moderate sense of control of this technology will be able to open up storytelling to a massive population we're, we're That's still the we're still it, it it still requires and probably will forever require a good story in the first Always. place though you need to have something to say and and i i think that that's true in in the image making which has now reached levels of near photo quality um getting very, very close to that. Um, if you don't have anything to say and you're just doing clever images, um, I think that there is a kind of a, a dulling of the influence of those. And, sure, and I mean it's always been like that. But I was I I I remember having been blown away by drone shots a lot more than the, than I'm now. Yeah, it's like that. Sure. Yeah. And now the, the you know every time you see a drone shot in a film, you go like, yeah, they didn't get a helicopter for that. It's yeah. a drone shot or some big crane shot on, you know, or low angle. Um, is that good, bad? It, you know, there's no there, there's no judgment there. But I mean, if you have a great story to tell and can tell it in a significant way, that's really good. That's that's a good question. Has the has the audience perception of AI already? changed is it already perceived as being cheap as being not special anymore hmm? i think mine, we're mine on a pivot certainly changed. we're on a cult fulcrum of that but uh, does it okay i i would i would stipulate that that really depends on if you if you if, if you can see that it's ai generated oh, if you can do, get a does feeling it, does, of it. Can, can can we like explore this a little bit because i i feel like i'm having a different reaction to to this new product than you guys are so yeah you know, for, for better or for worse you know uh, uh, there's a couple of things going through my head right now so yeah we were talking about you know back projection for car chases the one that's often quoted is 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 dr no filmed in 1962 and bullet filmed in 67 maybe 68 i can't remember 
and uh, and between those two dates you know the the camera technology moves on sufficiently that you could actually film a car chase right as as we would know it today whereas if you look at dr no um it's it's very much you know they're sat in a studio in a car and a film is playing behind them whereas bullet of course has a legendary car chase in it um so, you know, and then I, again, I'm also reminded of the backgrounds in Hanna-Barbera cartoons of like the 60s and 70s and stuff like that. How people were, yeah, characters would run and every every couple of seconds the background would repeat the pattern. So, um, yeah, yeah so this, this might be great at that. I, I, do you know, I, I'm, I may be missing the point here. So correct me like if I am, but I'm a bit underwhelmed by this. I'm having a kind of a so what moment. It's just like. I, I can see how it 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 would generate good, average to good, you know, background material or B roll or something like that. And yes, of course, it'll yeah, it'll change the the industries that are you know less creative, but but more you know, you know in the ways that they are, um, the, the the ways that they use video. But it won't replace stories, right? Because no, stories never. are cool, right? And so, it won't, yeah. And <clears throat> it won't. I, d- I don't know. I d- it it feels like may- maybe there's just too many announcements coming thick and fast. But it's I'm, I'm, it's kind of tiring, <laughs> isn't it? I'm not. Yeah, yeah fatigue. I have. I have. AI announcement fatigue, right? I'm going to declare that a new <laughs> medical syndrome. Now. We all do. I'm going to go do. and get a wet towel and put it mm-hmm. over my head just so, so I sit in a dark room. I think. I have, a, I have a counterpoint to that. Um, there is a video series out there right now by a channel called The Movie Rabbit Hole. And the series is titled No CGI is Really Just Invisible CGI. Oh, I was about to say the same thing. So what, what he does is yeah. um, he takes a part and it's, it's four parts now. And I think he'll continue that. And it's really amazing because um, when we... In in the recent past, have heard announcements of of movies. Often they would say, "Yeah, we are doing all our effects pr- practically, and there's no CGI, and so on." And um, he takes these announcements. Uh, one example in his third installment of this series is the Barbie movie, and and they they prominently claim there's no CGI. We built the sets for real, and so on. Um, and it, it turns out, of course, there's like 1,500 uh, VFX shots in there. Um, the filmmakers, the people behind the scenes in, in interviews and stuff, they ha- happily talk about all the CGI they were using. The studios themselves are ap- apparently worried that news gets out that they are using uh, CGI. So they are... Um, they're very cautious in the communication and making sure and so on, even to the point where they edit out green and blue screens of the behind the scenes footage, the bonus material. Interesting. You see, you, you have yeah. video bonus material that where, that where they're obviously shooting in front of a green screen and that is keyed out with a sky or a landscape <laughs> and so on. <laughs> so, and, and, but the, 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 the point I want to make is this video series, and we'll link this in the show notes, is it makes it very clear that even the earliest, like Hitchcock movies and even earlier, matte paintings were everywhere. Sure. That fakery is normal in movie production. And, and you don't notice most of it. And yeah. it's it's all in the service of the story. So when you don't notice AI anymore and it's in service of a good story, is it so then still the a problem? Pick up well, on, because I think we, we we risk as as a group as a team we risk being somewhat inconsistent, right? Because we have a lot of our shows where we talk about you know these AI enabled tools are not changing the nature of of art and changing it. They, they are literally just tools, and creative artists will employ those tools or deploy those tools, you know, in in, in the in the service of their art, right? And you know, I mean, Jeremiah, you've had gallery shows, right? You know, where where a lot of the the art that you produce, the AI element of it, is a core element of it by deliberate choice. You're using those tools and exploring how you can make art with them. So I I wonder if we're at risk of being slightly inconsistent when we say this will change everything. Well, do we, do we, have do we, we ever been consistent? <laughs> there, there, there's a couple of a couple of things. You know, having worked with a lot of um, great uh, special effects companies with very talented artists. One of the things that 
the artists themselves pride the, pride themselves on is creating uh, the invisibility of their work, like that. It, you know, so that a scene or a or a film that is filled with all kinds of CGI and AI and all kinds of delicate, whether it's simple wire removals, sign removals, background replacements, set additions, whatever it is, that you cannot tell. And yet, during award season, they're all shooting themselves in the head because they go, nobody knows all our work. You know what I mean? They want the Marvel universe of seeing again and again and again and again buildings, falling cars, leaping through space, crashes, and all of the rest of it. And there is that fatigue, uh, you know, with the audiences. We've seen these effects again and again and again and again until they become tiring and there's no reason to go see the movie just because the earth is being completely destroyed by some super villain. When we first encountered it, we would rush to the movies because we've never seen anything like it. But after the hundredth time of seeing the cities being wiped out and the beams of light destroying buildings and them come crashing down, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, it becomes tiring. We go back to the characters. Okay. So the invisibility serves the story. If there's no story, what we used to say when kind of thinking about music is what we would call production seduction. Um, remember that band, Yes? Oh, right? yeah. Like yeah, yeah. where you have like incredibly elaborate, technical, big, what I'd call big sonic production. And then what, what replaced it? You know, um, the Seattle sound, raw, you know, mm. you know what I mean? Um, Kurt Punk Cobain, as well. you know yeah. what I mean? Boom, mm -hmm. with, with none. And so somewhere in between the rawness and the overproduced, you know, lies our kind of dynamic back and forth, back and forth. What's fresh, what feels fresh is also in counterpoint, which what feels new. Tools are just tools. Stories are unique to the individual. I mean, they say, yes, there are only seven basic stories, but all told through maybe, you know, nine billion um, points of view. And that creates sort of a closeness to it. Um, I watched a movie called El Conde, the other, and I highly recommend this movie. And if it's not out near you, it will be soon. It's about Augustus Pinochet um, and his life and work. As a vampire, it's all shot huh? by Eddie Lockman. It's up for an Academy Award. In, it's shot in black and white. The effects are absolutely subtle, beautiful, amazing. And the story is so unique and compelling that we don't watch that movie for its effects as a vampire show movie. We watch it just because it's so original. And, you know, I, I think this is all consistent. Um, you know, when we look at, like, science and technology have always uh, uh, created the opportunity for new ways of telling stories. The Flemish painters came into, you know, into repute, shall we say, because Lapis had opened up uh, the trade routes and lapis was able to be imported into uh, Italy at the time, which created the conditions with the re-exploration of linseed oil as a color. And the slow drying paints mixed uh, with the oils dried slowly on canvas, which was also a technological uh, opportunity because of weaving technology that allowed a more realistic manipulation of paint on the canvas. It wouldn't dry so quickly because it used to be on board and very simple color. So the early Flemish painters were as much technologists in their embrace of both weaving technology, color technology, well, to create an aesthetic. And, and I don't think we're, we're changed in that way. Some of the paintings were amazing. Some of them weren't. And, and, um, we as creative individuals will, for the most part, 
embrace technology, whether it's kind of consciously or not, in our creation of work. I mean, nobody thinks of sketching on an iPad as being kind of breakthrough now, but like Hockney did. But it, you know, it, it was maybe 10 years ago or 15 years ago. Um, it all comes down to story and it all comes down to what technical tools do you need to express your intention? That's it. It's just very, very simple. Now, we are we're kind of addicted to technology as a historical. Really? It's fun, you right? Think we, so. You know, anything that kind of crosses our desk is like, oh, got to use that, got to try that. That's fun. It's great. It, it's like cooking with a new spice, right? Try this, try that, or a new, you know, a new sous vide machine, right? Remember sous vide machines ten years ago? It's like everything has to be sous vide: egg sous vide, steak sous vide, vegetables. Sous -vide. Now it's like, who talks about sous vide? The main Mainly restaurants use them a lot, but yeah. we don't talk about them. Um, so the point the point is, there are those of us who embrace technology. There are those of us who push it away. But we're all influenced by technology, whether we like it or not. That's my rant. <laughs> and it's a jolly good one. Um, <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, and this is one of the things, since I love these conversations, because we, like, we all approach these things from a different angle. I, I'm... So I can definitely see that you know, you know, generative video is a tool that can be used in support of creativity. Um, I probably, as as with a lot of these things, when they get automated and uh, and become a lot cheaper and quicker than yes, the, to to generate, then I can see that there'll be impact on certain people's jobs and things like that. So maybe maybe this is the that maybe this is a pivotal point in in I don't know, let's say movie production or or TV or video production or something like that. Certainly, I can see you know these sorts of techniques being used a lot in music videos. Yeah, definitely yeah. could be used a lot in music videos. Commercials for sure. I, 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 I had a question that I don't think I'll ask. I'll, I'll still put it here, but I don't. I don't expect an answer. The question w would have been, when are we going to see the first kid in a basement um, create a major blockbuster? But then. Yeah. That is, I think, not the right question. I think, how long is it going to take until we have all personalized video production in our pockets and no one is going to see the same show as another person? Well, that, that's a very, very good question. That's the right question. You, your your device is... I, I, I no, see your face. I know watches the same TV programs. I so see. Very no, no, few. no. no. The, the TV program will be generated for you by the device in your pocket. It'll happen. If it's not a shared experience, is it kind of pointless? Well, that is the question. If you can't hang around with your friends and family and talk about the uh, talk about an experience, is, is it? I mean, I, I, I don't aren't think we, I'd yeah. want to watch that. Aren't aren't we? Aren't we uh, just at this point uh, beginning to be um, educated and trained into accepting not not as shared experiences? I'm thinking Apple Vision Pro. Well, that's a very good question. Well, they will be shared at one point. They will make yes. that shared at one point. Because currently sure. the downside of the Apple Vision Pro yeah. is that it cannot be shared. Yeah. In other words, I can invite somebody, I cannot invite someone who is say, wearing the same goggles to experience what I'm experiences, experiencing in that dynamic space. That would be fantastic. And the fact that I have to experience those things on my own diminishes the experience itself. I, I think we're... It's only I think a couple of releases away, though, isn't it? I mean, it's yeah, not... Yeah, pretty sure. I think so. Pretty sure. So, and of course, Adrian, you're 100% right. The shared experience is important, so... No, I, I would argue... So, so I've been trying to just or, sit here while Or we you'll have a about... similar experience, but you will start discussing um, how did that go look for you? How did that yeah. work? What what happened the, there on, on your screen or in your virtual space? Yeah... That that sounds like a novelty that would wear off very. Did you wear because... Did you wear blue or blue or red pants? Yeah, that, yeah, that's that, that sounds that sounds like a novelty that wear off quickly. So, so I, I've been trying to think of what like how, what really has changed stuff in 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 this particular area, right? And I, I keep coming back to in my head 
the flat screen TV, or would I should I say yeah, uh, plasma or LCD, the the flat body TV, not flat screen, mm-hmm. because that then allowed people to build home cinemas for the first time at an affordable price, and you could have a shared experience, and uh, you know it's yeah, and you could you could experience things in a different way, especially the yeah, yeah, big big screen TV with with, a, with an audio system, and suddenly. You and your friends, or you and your family, can can choose to watch whatever movie you want and experience it, you know, a, a, as a as a small group without too many interruptions. I wonder I if there's that, a direct that feels correlation to me like between the d- diminishing of the audiences in cinemas with that technology. I wonder yeah. if there's. A I don't think I want to live in a world where the the audience of every production is one person and it's me. <laughs> Because surely they're, they're, at that point there'll be there'll be no money in it, and therefore it'll just be generated nonsense. It'd just be crap. <laughs> It'd just be crap. Or, by the way, or it could be brilliant, but only <laughs> you. But will only know. you know that it's brilliant. <laughs> mm. There's yes, no way I of think object, I've got... objectifying the fact okay. that this is I... genius. Anyway, let's, this is an elliptical dis- discussion that yeah, will let's get leave us it. nowhere. Let's well, leave it at point, that. I, th- I think it's it's highly interesting, and I'm I'm very very curious where where this is going to lead us. Well, I think what's interesting here is how, if we're talking about the future of photography, how will we be able to integrate um, our own sense of capture with our own devices, whatever they may be with the manipulation that is available, both in still and in film. Um, For example, if we're taking home movies and the light is not right, you know, people are on the the lawn and it starts to rain and everybody's sad, you go like, let's change it to a sunny day and get everybody smiling. Um, That will be possible very, very shortly. The integration of the real and the unreal is coming. And and I think that's going to provoke some unique and interesting um, images, films, and experiences, um, however they be, um, you know, exploited, shown, um, and distributed. we'll have major backlash, and the handmade you, movie will you, be you will. valued Ger- beyond Jeremiah, anything. Jeremiah, right now you sound like that extended family member that insists on photoshopping the person that couldn't make it into the yeah, family photo. That's what that's I'm talking about. Like, oh, no, 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 it wasn't. No. Uh, well, this I'm, is I'm, this is this is how Reginald happens, right? This is <laughs> that's that's uh, yeah. Okay, um, let's. I think let's leave it at that. There's there's plenty of food for thought in this episode, and of course, we would love to hear everyone else's um, opinions on that. You can discuss with us on our Discord, tfttf.com slash join tfop. Uh, and uh, with that, let's move on into the picks of the week. Um, I'm, I'm, I'll bring one um, that is a YouTube video and it relates to the flat screen because it is a video about uh, why it was almost impossible to make the blue LED. So... Uh, we are all of an age where we remember the blue LED not being a thing. We had red LEDs, we had green LEDs, and uh, YouTube channel Veritasium goes down the rabbit hole of why it was virtually impossible to make the blue LED and what it has enabled. Because um, goes back to a guy called uh, Shuji Nakamuro, and uh, he pretty much worked for years and years and years on um, the technology behind it. It's, it's, a, it's a quite technical video. It explains a lot of like how this works on a physical uh, side. And um, it took until the early 1990s until a blue LED was possible and after, shortly after that, the white LED was possible. And that has changed the world he's he got a physics nobel prize uh, for that um because our flat screens wouldn't be possible without blue leds um our well christmas I'm, lights i'm I, 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 i'm looking at one two three four led light sources with hundreds of leds in them white leds in them 
Um, that wouldn't be possible without that. Um, our entire house with its, I don't know, 25 light bulbs consumes at full power less than 200 watts, which is just <laughs> mind-blowing uh, if you... If you think yeah, you yeah. want to you wanted to do to to heat that house with thousands of or, or many kilowatts of light to get the same brightness light is virtually for free now so um that's the story of the blue led and how it changed virtually everything so um, for, the, I didn't for the whole family one. adrian yeah. for the whole family Yes. For the whole family. I'm going to go watch that though because that that sounds really interesting yep, I'm it is very interesting the geek in me definitely um, Adrian, you brought us something completely different. So what I, I think at? I'm just the I'm just the grumpy old man of the team today, <laughs> right? I think. Sorry about this. Um, I, I I will endeavour to be more on message with the team next week. So, um, I bring you the UK government's national AI strategy. Oh, wow! Right, which which right, has man. nothing to do with photography as such. Um, and it's obviously not going to be very interesting to a great many people. But uh, and I don't know whether your countries, uh, you guys have uh, an equivalent to this yet. Our 10 year plan to make Britain a global AI superpower. Yeah, I mean, there's a bit of politicking in it, of obviously, course it is, yeah. but actually there's a lot of stuff to do with. Yeah, so, so, yes, I mean, that's industrial strategy for the nation. But there is also stuff about safety in there and stuff like that. So, you know, and, and things so. There's, I think it's um, it, it's it's interesting to see now that there are you know national government responses to some of these things. You know, um, I mean, we had last year, didn't we? We had some of the big AI producers shouting about the need for regulation and what have you, which um, which uh, I think was met with uh, a fair amount of cynicism by a lot of people which is like, yeah derision yeah, let, maybe let's, it, derision is another good word for it yes yeah uh, i was being i was trying to be a bit kind but yes i think you know the people that had already made it big regulating it making it much harder for people to get started in the industry so it seemed a bit you know a bit off at the time didn't it so um yeah it's nothing to do with photography i'm afraid but it is it is a real world example of a national response to emerging ai which is the topic of today's episode would i just ask you um both of you that uh, the interesting thing is that those who purport to try and create some regulation for the most part know very little about the technology yeah. same as crypto and in other words, you have these people who did not grow up with it or not really invested in it, who have not really embraced it and don't know it really well, trying to create the conditions for others to, you know, to operate within that realm. It's very... And then those who do know it well and are experts are all those who are pretty much in control of the technology and you don't want them to regulate it either so i don't know it's the human conundrum right now <laughs> it is and by the way adrian i don't think you're the grumpy man here in the in the discussion um you 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 you, you offer a very good counterpoint and yeah. good food for discussion so well thank you sir thank you for that i we know that chris and i will always follow anything down around of course <laughs> of course like dogs chasing cars well, you know, even yeah. it leads to humanity's complete destruction. We're <laughs> we're all on board. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> all right. And My, last but not least, Tatsuo Suzuki. I thought I'd bring a pick that is as far from CG as one could get. This is like Thank you. Really, Thank you. Just, this is pure photography from a genius street photographer shooting in black and white. And it's absolutely dazzling. I, I thought it would be very, very interesting um, to, to remember the purity of just going out with a camera, taking a picture, grabbing and grabbing imagery, and why these things provoke, promote that. And we could say that you could recreate many of these things in CG in AI, but the discovery of this in your life, the way of seeing, the way of being, the way of being present, uh, through the uh, convention of the photographic process, 
Uh, there's nothing like it, and I, I never want to forget that, even with my embrace of new technologies. Well, thank you, Jeremiah, for sneaking some photography into our podcast today. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm blown away by the photographs I'm looking at here, yeah, and I must say, a lot of these <clears throat> are as weird as stuff you would have generated with an AI and Correct. just knowing that they are real and that they are actual people um, and actual situations is, is, is making a big difference. So is that the Kurt Cobain of photography? <laughs> is wow. This stuff is good. I, yeah. Link, link in the show notes, everyone make sure to check that out. That is, that is the, that is the, the, um, like almost the archetype of street photography. Yeah, I mean, yeah. look at that Genius. stuff. It's just okay. Wow, thank you very much. That is that is very cool. All right, AI and real photography. Where are we going to end up? Well, we'll find out. We'll we'll find out in Ooh, yeah. I don't know in a year from now, two years, five years, or six months. <laughs> Or six months. Or we next don't week. know. <laughs> next we week. don't know. The the development is quick, and we, um, yeah, we are about the future of photography, and so that has to have its space on this episode, on on this show, of course. All right, we are. Uh, we're at the end of the episode. We'll be back in a week from now, and uh, join our discord discuss with us on tfttf.com slash join tfop link is in the show notes um, also at the future of photography.com and with that everyone have a great week and see you soon until then take care take care bye bye, bye, -bye. you've been listening to the future of photography Subscribe to the show wherever you get your other podcasts. Find the show notes and more information at thefutureofphotography.com. Hold up. 